Good afternoon, everyone. We're, we're going to make a start. My name is Jeremy Deer. I'm Deputy General Secretary of the International Federation of Journalists and very proud to be asked to chair um, today's webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to today's event taking place during the United Nations Human Rights Council's 47th session and a critical part of the continuing fight for justice for Anton, 10 years after his murder at the hands of Libyan forces. All those of us involved in media freedom campaigns talk about impunity and statistics about killings of and threats to journalists on a regular basis. But what we must never forget is that behind every headline, behind every statistic is a partner, a family, colleagues, and Anton's widow Penny and other family members and colleagues join us today. Let me extend a special welcome to all of them, and you will hear directly from Penny shortly. But I also know they and the campaign are grateful to all those who've joined the fight for justice for Anton and would like particularly to thank the Justice for Journalists Foundation for their support. What the statistics do not tell us is that each killing also represents the loss of a courageous journalist who documents war and conflict so that we as citizens might know the truth. Anton was just such a photojournalist, not just award-winning, but capable of capturing images that spoke of pain, of struggle, of humanity. He sought to understand his subjects in order to better tell their story. Anton's killing deprived the world of an important window on the Libyan civil war. Since then, government inaction has deprived Anton and his family of justice. For 10 years, demands for answers have been met with silence, misinformation and worse lies. Today is about saying that impunity, those lies, the cover up must end and that the international community, including the UN, must demand action and answers. There must be accountability. Over the next hour, our excellent panel will share their personal stories of Anton, explain the legal and advocacy campaign for justice, and crucially, discuss what you can do to help support efforts to end the criminal lack of action in this case. Before we start, a few points just to ensure today's event will run smoothly. The session is being recorded. Please remember to keep your microphone on mute unless invited to speak. We will have a short time for some questions at the end. So if you have something you want to ask, please use the Q&A facility or raise your hand and I will take as many questions as time allows. To set the context for today's discussion, we're going to start with a short introductory video to Anton's remarkable work and how he was killed on the 5th of April 2011. The voiceover in this video is by fellow journalist James Foley, who witnessed his murder. My name is James Foley. I'm, I'm 38 years old. I'm a freelancer, a writer, and, and videographer. Last year, I was captured in Libya for 44 days, and I was with Anton Hamill when he was killed that day. I only knew Anton for five days. He was this kind of guy who had a light inside of him that really brought people to them. He was humble and open, and we started to work together a little bit. And that morning, it was myself, Claire Gillis, Manu Bravo, and Anton Hamill. And we were ambushed just outside of Brega by two Qaddafi vehicles, probably about 10 soldiers, you know, just like firing. He was killed immediately when we were ambushed. And it was that unforgettable, horrible feeling of not being able to help him and not being able to go back for him because we were captured. Also, the decision we had to make to not tell any Libyan authorities that we were witness to this war crime because we all felt that that would put our own eventual freedom in, in jeopardy. Penny was led to believe that he was alive despite increasing evidence that something was very wrong. But right away, within the first couple of days, Penny had an idea that something was wrong. Two weeks later, when we could all call home, 
and Anton didn't call home, of course. She knew she must have known something was very wrong. She tried as much as she could to get to find out what was going on, and several times the regime told her, "He's alive. We know he's alive." We were we were ambushed, and Anton was killed on April fifth, two thousand eleven, and we weren't released until uh, May nineteenth, and that's when we told Penny that he he was in fact killed immediately. And that was it. I mean, that was probably the hardest part. Thank you for that video and to give a personal account, not just about Anton, but about the case and her and the family search for truth and justice, please welcome Penny, Anton's widow. Penny, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, you know, no matter how many times I hear it, that account from um, the late James Foley just still hits so hard. My heart is beating crazily right now. To think of the journalists Anton, James, Claire Gillis and Mono Bravo out there, vulnerable but brave, um, committed in Libya to telling the stories of the reality of the front line, the reality of poorly armed rebels taking on the might of the Gaddafi dictatorship. And yet without any provocation, they came under attack. The accounts are clear from what we know. You know, the heavily armed Gaddafi forces shot directly at them. There was no crossfire. Anton was hit. Anton was killed in cold blood. And we were misled in the most cruel way for about 44 days into believing he was alive and well and detained with the other journalists. But the Libyan authorities didn't just mislead us, they also misled the governments of South Africa and Austria, the countries for which Anton held dual citizenship. But the story didn't end the day he was shot. And that's why we're here today. We're in pursuit of the truth the facts as to what happened. We need to know what happened next after Anton was shot in the Libyan desert. It's been 10 very difficult years, enduring an injustice which quite frankly has stripped us and left our family severely traumatized and feeling just sheer agony because of the helplessness. We need the story to be heard. We need this matter be, to be given a full and proper airing. We need to know what the facts are. You know, I get asked every so often why we're doing this. Are we living in the past? What are we hoping to achieve? What do we want really? It's simple, it's truth, it's justice. I want to know what happened from the moment Anton was shot. There are questions around his death that haunt me, that haunt his children, that haunt his parents, his brother. We want to know who killed Anton. What did they do with his body? What did they do with his possessions, his camera? Where are his killers now? 10 years ago when he went missing, we had to rely on journalists like Jeremy Bowen to get information as to what was actually happening on the ground in Libya. Now this is information you normally expect you'd be provided with by the local authorities or public bodies or governments. And yet it was the journalists who had to take on the responsibility of trying to investigate around what was happening to one of their own. And sometimes it was a great personal risk. Take James Foley, who was hugely supportive to us after Anton was disappeared. He and Claire were among the journalists who returned to Libya to help us find Anton's remains. They shouldn't have had to do this. The various states at the center of this case, the murder and disappearance of Anton's body have all signed up to global rules that obligate them to investigate matters like ours. They signed up to these international treaties. That means they have a clear responsibility to pursue an inquiry where a person has been killed or disappeared. But not only has no one been prosecuted, there's just never been a full or formal investigation. Initial steps were taken by the International Criminal Court, but they appear to be halted after Gaddafi died and there has been no investigation by Libya or the key states, South Africa or Austria, or even the UK where Anton lived. 
There is a clear obligation upon the Libyan authorities to investigate, but it is apparent there is simply no political will or investigative capacity for this to happen. Our ordinary family, quite frankly, has never been in a position to pursue any investigation, being so far removed from the scene and without the resource or the specialist skills this, that this requires. But the states involved have always had access to legal channels and resources that they could put into action if they decided to. We trusted the governments involved to help us bring out on home and investigate his death and none of that has happened. The legal team and I believe Anton's killing and disappearance are war crimes. They constitute violations, we believe, of Anton's right to life and my and my family's fundamental right to know his fate. 10 years is too long to have lived without the answers. So what then should the international community do? While the United Nations remains a powerful authority that we believe can help us in attaining a full and thorough inquiry, Libya has a transitional government in place and the climate now is more conducive for a proper investigation to take place. The time is now. Anton's killing was an injustice. We need accountability for what happened. We need the United Nations to seriously consider our case and act to end the injustice and to end the ongoing violation of our right as a family to know what's happened to Anton. It is unacceptable that anyone should lose their lives the way Anton did without any culpability. Family matters, the truth matters and justice matters. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you so much, Penny, and for a, a powerful um, testimony and a very clear call on the international community um, to take action. And you talked about the context in which the events happened and the context today to give us more of a country and regional context. I'd like to welcome next Jeremy Bowen, the BBC Middle East editor, who has a vast experience reporting from the front line in Libya and in the region, um, and maybe talk a little about the impunity for crimes against journalists and others in the Middle East and Libya. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and thanks everybody. And Penny, I, I couldn't agree with you more that this is a good time to be doing this because there is now this transitional government in Libya and while many issues remain and a great deal of confusion at times and chaos and also violence remain in the country and a lot of uncertainty, it's a better situation for this kind of legal uh, challenge and enterprise than it was when there were two fully active governments, one based in Tripoli and one based in Benghazi. To give some context, first of all, to um, uh, how things were back in, in 2011, uh, it was, as you may well all recall, the year of the Arab uprisings, the so-called Arab Spring, this great movement of people who were hoping for, well, better lives. And in rapid succession, after the Tunisian president was overthrown in January, of 2011, the, uh, the president of Egypt, Mubarak, was also overthrown and uprisings started in various other countries in, in Yemen, there was one in Bahrain, there was trouble and demonstrations in loads of places and in no time at all a fully fledged uprising started against the regime of uh, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi in Libya and it was um, it very rapidly escalated into being a, a full-on civil war and of course journalists wanted to cover it. Now I was, um, I found myself on the on the regime side uh, and uh, Anton and his colleagues were, were, were working with the rebels on their side. Now a lot of the war though was, you know, Libya is an enormous country but what makes me think is that there will be people who know exactly what happened Mm -hmm. and we'll know where his remains are, is that actually a lot of the fighting took place along a particularly distinct area, 
there is a, a road that runs along the Mediterranean coast, right along the whole country from uh, the border with uh, Tunisia in the west and right across past Tripoli and Benghazi and then further east till they get to the to, to Tobruk and then the Egyptian border. Now, a lot of what was going on on that month in that year was uh, toing and froing of a very violent nature, back and forth. Uh, it was quite mobile. The rebels, a lot of them were in various kinds of pickup trucks with uh, guns known as technicals mounted on the, the back. The vehicles were known as technicals. So I do think that there will be people there who will know exactly what happened. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if they know where that guy, that photographer's body is buried. Um, and so what's important is clearly to try to find out and to get the cooperation of people in Libya uh, who are able to, to mount that kind of investigation. You mentioned, Jeremy, the impunity that uh, governments and regimes and groups have in the Middle East. Well, unfortunately, it's not just the Middle East, but let's talk about the Middle East in this particular case. Now, as journalists like myself go to places like that, you know, knowing the dangers, Anton will have known the dangers. We're not children. We know what we're getting into. We know it's dangerous and don't necessarily expect much protection. But I do think that people's families and in people's memories, they deserve the, the chance to have some, some, some justice and some knowledge about, about what, what happened. Because, you know, it could well be, it'd be good to know what happened, what the circumstances were. Uh, when people have cameras, they're quite, and they're, they're also foreigners, they're not Libyans. They stick out, you know, as a journalist in that situation, you stick out like a sore thumb. People know who you are. People, fighters will know that there may be, there were, and there were a lot of journalists, photojournalists, cameramen, all sorts of people who were active in the area uh, of the, the fighting that was going on. So um, people will know that you were, were there at the time. But the thing is, the issue is, there is a lot of impunity because there is not, you know, in the Middle East, the main problems, problem is governance. And when countries lack adequate, fair, law-based governance, then those, uh, you know, the men with power, armed groups are able to operate with impunity and they continue to do so and people do disappear and the only way often that they get justice is if there is a loud enough and persistent enough process that starts out to try to get them what they deserve in terms of that and of course the more that people are conscious that they can't just get away with it uh, then it's um it's a, it becomes a deterrent uh, from here's uh, just to finish up um i was in uh, i covered the the wars of the former yugoslavia very uh, extensively from the beginning to the end and i was in sarajevo at the time of the uh, you know srebrenica massacres uh, i testified in four different trials in the former yugoslavia war crimes tribunal and all of us, you know, very wise journalists, when it was announced and the war was still going on, that a tribunal was going to be set up to investigate war crimes, we were all, we were very skeptical. To be honest, we thought it was just going to be a load of guff, that nothing would come out of it. But actually, after many years of hard work by a lot of very dedicated people, investigators, attorneys, you name it, uh, witnesses, uh, there is now not just the fact that leading protagonists have been brought to justice, but the fact that there is an historical record, which is in the records of that tribunal about what happened in great detail. So as a journalist, I was very happy to contribute in a small way to, to all of that. Um, reporting that I did was accepted as evidence. 
So uh, I do think that it is worthwhile pursuing this kind of legal enterprise because otherwise people are just going to feel that they can get away with it. And that's not good for anybody. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And I mean, those words will echo with all journalists that the more noise, the more uh, the penalty that people have to pay for the crimes that they carry out against journalists, the safer every journalist is, no matter where they are um, in the world. But you also talked about a loud enough and persistent enough voice. One of the important voices uh, throughout this campaign has been Anton's colleagues and friends in South Africa. Um, and to give us a, a, a South African perspective on this, including the importance of Anton's journalistic contribution, the impact of his disappearance and death on South Africans in 2011, and how the South African journalist community is now supporting the campaign, um, I'd like to welcome Sabu Ngalwa, uh, the chair of the South African National Editors Forum. Welcome. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. And I think uh, it's important that I state from the outset that uh, as SANEF, which is a collective of editors, senior journalists, and journalism trainers from all over South Africa, that we stand in solidarity with Penny, her family, and everyone else who wants to know the truth behind Anton's murder. The work of journalists in South Africa and media freedom, rather, is protected in our constitution in section 16 of our constitution. And for us, when we were called upon to be part of this campaign, we did not hesitate as SANEF. And we immediately wrote to President Sarah Ramaphosa to ask that our country assists in every way possible to make sure that there is an investigation or at the very least, uh, something is done by both the government of South Africa and the Department of International Relations to get these answers that have been outstanding for a long 10 years. I must say uh, to everyone who's here that we did get a response um, that the, our Department of uh, International Relations will be following up on that and that they will be able to assist what we will do on our end, because we do know that governments are prone to making promises. Um, and this is not to prejudge this process, but to say that we will do whatever possible to make sure that that commitment is fulfilled. And as we meet here uh, today, our hearts go out to Penny and their family for the decade long suffering that they've endured since the tragic murder and the attack on their husband. To us, Anton was a colleague. When I arrived at independent newspapers, he still worked for independent newspapers. By the time I moved to Johannesburg, he had just left. But from the accounts of colleagues, I know, and from the work that I've seen, I know and we all know that Anton was a committed professional and a talented photojournalist. He was passionate about his work and he was proud. He was a proud family man. And as I said, that he had worked at independent newspapers here for many years, having worked at the Star, the Saturday Star, and the Sunday Independent. He was respected by his colleagues and some of his colleagues describe him as a solid professional who loved his job. Clearly we know how he ended up in Libya. He was a fearless journalist and his death shocked many in this country. And at the time of his disappearance, there were a number of campaigns that were led by some of our colleagues outside the parliament of South Africa and also at various uh, localities drawing attention to the disappearance of Anton. I think for us as SANEF, it's easy to say, to, to see why we would align ourselves to this campaign because Anton was a colleague and also he was a South African citizen and he had worked with many of our colleagues. And I think that a loss of a journalist in the course of their duty is one thing, but to be killed under such circumstances in a conflict zone and with complete disregard for his status as a journalist is a worrying factor as it has implications, not just um, for Anton's family, but for other journalists who find themselves in senior um, circumstances. So the circumstances under which Anton died remain unresolved. They say if they remain unresolved, they set a bad precedent in how such a 
forces or government forces in conflict zone can just attack, attack journalists and not be held accountable and go get away with impunity. So I think for us, that is why we have decided to be part of this and understanding that SANEF is, com is, is committed to championing South Africa's hard-won freedom of expression, promoting equality, ethics, and diversity in the South African media. We believe that 10 years is a long time and every family, when they lose a loved one, they deserve closure. And that is why we will continue with this fight. As I said, we have um, made contact with the relevant authorities and that we will continue to make sure that we can do whatever is possible to make sure that the South African government can at the very least put pressure on their Libyan counterparts, that we get the answers. As Jeremy said before me, someone was there, someone knows, and someone should be able to at the very least tell us where Anton's last, um, um, uh, last resting place is. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for that powerful message of support and, and solidarity from uh, Anton's colleagues uh, in South Africa. Can I just remind everybody that if you have questions or comments to make, there is uh, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, which you can type your questions into. And after all the panelists, I will come back and take as many of those um, as I can. Uh, our next speaker um, is Keelan Gallagher QC from Doughty Street Chambers, who I've been lucky enough to work with on a number of international justice campaigns and she's going to take us through the legal steps that have been taken already in pursuit of justice the remedies that have been sought but also particularly important the things that you can do now to support the campaign and to progress the case for justice keelan thank you so much jeremy and thank you to everyone who's spoken so far uh, may i also thank everyone who's joined us today and indeed, to those of you watching this recording later, we're conscious that a number of states in particular have been unable to join us this afternoon because of Human Rights Council commitments, but intend to catch up on the recording later. We're conscious it's a very busy week for everyone, and particularly for those of you in Geneva at the UN Human Rights Council. We're so grateful to you for your time and your support. Now today, of course, the most important person in the room is missing, Anton Hamerl, a brilliant photojournalist, deeply committed to his craft. You heard James Foley's words describing him as a guy with a light inside of him. And you've seen examples of his work in the video at the outset, incredibly powerful images, many of which you may have seen but not realized who the talented photographer was who lay behind them. Behind Penny today, you may have spied Anton's own photograph, a rare photograph of the photographer. I'm told he didn't like having his own photograph taken being used to being behind the lens, not in front of it. And of course, it's often said that no journalist wants themselves to become the story. But 10 years ago, when Anton was killed by pro-Gaddafi forces in cold blood on the 5th of April, 2011, he did become the story, although for 45 intolerably painful days, uh, in fact, Penny and her family understood that he was alive and missing but he did become the story in 2011. And today we ask all of you to help us to ensure his story is told and not forgotten. Now, Penny explained very powerfully earlier what she seeks and why 10 years on. And she said, it's truth and it's justice. Now working together with Penny and Anton's family, we've identified two key strategic legal aims at this stage. The first is locating Anton's remains and returning them to his family. And it's key just to mention, many of you will have been bereaved and will have lost close loved ones, but you'll have a grave at which you can go to grieve. And Penny and her children and Anton's other family members simply don't have that. And one of Penny's children was a newborn at the time Anton was killed, aged only six weeks old. He's now 10. And her other son was aged seven at the time and he's now 17. And their childhood has been dominated by this issue. And Penny and her sons and Anton's other family members, many of whom are here today, are entitled to have a place to go and grieve. But also critically, if Anton's remains are in fact located and returned, 
that automatically triggers an entitlement for Penny to have the investigation that she's been waiting for within the UK. So technicality of whether or not Anton's body has been located is key to whether or not she gets an investigation under the law in the UK. And that's not good enough because the second thing which we seek is regardless of whether or not Anton's remains are located and returned to Penny and her family in London, in any event, she is entitled as a matter of international law to have an investigation into both his killing on the 5th of April 2011, uh, which I and my colleagues on the legal team believe from the material we have seen to be a war crime, uh, but she is also entitled to an investigation into the aftermath, into the 45 days of cover up and lies when Penny was told that her husband was alive, would be calling her, was well and in detention, when a number of governments were misled by the Libyan authorities. But she's also entitled into, to an investigation into the foot dragging and lack of action that we've seen since 2011. So she's entitled to those things. So from the material we've got, let's start first of all with the issue about returning Anton's remains. Uh, Jeremy Bowen spoke very powerfully earlier about how there are likely to be breadcrumbs, there's likely to be a trail, there's likely to be evidence. And we know that to be true because in 2012, Penny and family were in fact contacted and told that it was suspected that Anton's remains may have been found in a mass grave in Libya. And the description fitted Anton. There was other uh, material to suggest that it may have been Anton. And there was essentially um, a political spat about who was going to conduct the forensic examination. And then the trail goes entirely cold. Now we know under the new Libyan uh, government, currently the interim government, uh, that there have in fact been some recent developments for families like Penny's, who've for a long time been waiting for their loved ones to be returned. Four Filipino oil workers who'd gone missing a number of years ago, killed by Daesh, uh, were in fact identified, located, and their remains returned only in March of this year. So Penny said earlier, some people say, why are you doing this uh, after 10 years and what do you hope to achieve? But there's a very realistic prospect for the reasons Jeremy gave and because of this additional background from 2012 to suggest that there is a paper trail and that in fact, Anton's remains can be located and returned. A key humane thing which should happen and would mean so much to the family. Secondly, in relation to the investigation, as a matter of international law, there is an obligation on the Libyan authorities to conduct the investigation I've referred to. And that doesn't apply only to the government that was in place at the time, it applies to the state. So it applies to Libya, regardless of who is in power then or now. So that's an ongoing obligation. Now, regrettably, after 10 years, Libya has not yet taken that step. And our view is that if Libya does not conduct the investigation which is needed, the international community must now step in and fill the investigative void. And that is critical. And in doing so, that will be of critical importance to get truth and justice for Penny. But it will also be a mechanism to learn lessons which will protect other journalists in future. Now, Penny mentioned earlier that in 2011, she was left in a position of having to rely on investigative journalists, NGOs and others to piece together material which should have been provided by official sources. And regrettably, 10 years on, we're doing exactly the same thing. Penny and her family are essentially op operating like private detectives, putting together material. Uh, we have, uh, since April, obtained key pieces of information from other investigative journalists. We've been working closely uh, with Claire Gillis, for example, and also with Diane Foley, James Foley's mother. One of the best sources of information we have are notebooks from James Foley when he was conducting his own investigation into this war crime. But what we haven't yet had, and what we urge you to do today, those of you who are from states, we haven't yet had engagement from states who can assist us in an official way. We have made freedom of information requests to the UK government, to South Africa, and to Austria, asking for documents that they have from the time, giving the information that they were provided with by the Libyan authorities at the time. And we await a response to those. And we hope those of you from Austria, South Africa, or the UK today will ensure that those freedom of information requests are actioned as quickly as possible. Uh, we also have made a complaint to the UN special procedures. We filed urgent appeals 
with the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killings, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, and the Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances. And we have asked all of them to acknowledge that there is a reasonable suspicion that there were grave breaches of international humanitarian law and international human rights law in this case, and that an investigation is called for. And critically this week, two of those special rapporteurs are reporting to the Human Rights Council. The special rapporteur on extrajudicial killings is due to be reporting this Wednesday, 30th of June. And thanks to the Redress Trust, uh, Penny uh, will be addressing the council directly and calling on the special rapporteur to take action. Those of you in the room from civil society and from states who have speaking rights on Wednesday, we ask you to support Penny's call. Similarly, on Thursday and Friday, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression is reporting to the Council. And again, we ask that this issue of impunity in relation to journalist deaths and Anton's case specifically be raised by you. We also ask those of you who are states to raise concerns about this case in your bilateral relations with Libya and indeed with the other governments involved, South Africa, the UK and Austria, and to do all in your power that you can to help. Now, was said earlier that this is not only a case about Anton, Sabu made that point very powerfully, and that's quite right, because the work of conflict journalists and conflict photojournalists like Anton is so critical in casting a light into dark places. And Anton went to Libya in 2011 at a time when there was widespread suspicion that Gaddafi forces may have been involved in serious violations of international humanitarian law, including war crimes and crimes against humanity. The material we've seen suggests that he was quite right. And he himself became a victim in doing what was a fundamental public service, casting a light into those dark corners. And both for Anton and for others who performed that vital role, we must have an investigation and we must have justice for Anton. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Keelan, for um, that roundup of the action that has been taken and what you need both civil society and member states to be doing over the next few days. And let me just draw your attention to the longer term campaigning, um, the Justice for Anton campaign. You can find out more online at justiceforanton.com and please uh, do that and find out how you can um, support that campaign. Before we move to questions and comments, and I see there are a few um, there, let me ask Baroness Helena Kennedy QC, um, Director of the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute and a member of the high level panel of legal experts on media freedom to um, uh, conclude these comments today to round them up for us and to set the scene for our discussion, Baroness Kennedy. It's a, it's a great privilege to be here. And, and when, whenever I hear from Penny um, about uh, the suffering of a family when this kind of crime takes place and whether, where there is impunity, it always, it always breaks my heart um, because it, you know, the, 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 what people don't seem to understand is that the absence of justice eats away at, uh, at those who, who are left behind. And so um, I, I come in support of this campaign um, because of my work internationally and because of my uh, role um, on this high level panel of legal experts who are looking at the whole business of how uh, the journalists around the world are increasingly in danger and, uh, and being killed. And we, we really have to say this has to stop. Um, but let me just uh, um, endorse some of the things that Keelan uh, Gallagher, um, a, a great lawyer who's at the heart of this uh, uh, legal team. Uh, I just wanted to, to reinforce some of the things that she was saying. Um, you know, democracies need, they, 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 they rely upon truth and we need the tellers of truth the purveyors of truth, and they are journalists. It's why media freedom is so important, and why uh, photojournalists like uh, our, our, our Anton are so vital to sustaining uh, uh, democracy. And, uh, and we need to hear, the world needs to hear what is happening. And, uh, and so 
that's why this is so vitally important and is wonderful. Uh, that Anton's campaign and that Penny has the support of journalists around the world from Jeremy Bowen and Jeremy Deere and Subu, who's spoken about the South African uh, colleagues being in support. But, you know, um, it's, and, and of course, then there are, there's a legal team, but it's, it's really important that it moves beyond the lawyers and the, and the journalists to speak out on this, because it is so important for all of us to know what is happening in our world. Um, when the state responsible for a journalist's death does not act, and, and Keelan mentioned this, when a state fails, I mean, you know, the state is a continuous thing. Governments come and go, but the state bears responsibility, whoever was actually uh, in place at a given time. And uh, the international co community can't stand idly by when a state refuses to take its responsibilities as Libya in this case is refusing to do. And, uh, and it, it, this is a failure to act in compliance with treaty obligations. Um, and so it's essential that the international community steps up. And the truth is the international community will only step up if we put pressure on it to do so. And so that's why I'm going to, I'm calling on all of you who might be here um, to uh, call for UN special procedures and to speak out about the case and for there to be an investigation, as you've just heard described, into Anton's death and the cover-up afterwards. And when Keelan mentions, Keelan Gallagher mentions the freedom of information requests, the reason those are important is because in amongst all of the files that are kept inside ministries, there will be documents which will be in answer to the inquiries made about where is An Anton at the time when, when uh, Penny was being told he was missing um, or that he was in custody and that he was still alive. When those inquiries were made, it's important to see who responded. What were the reference numbers on it? It helps absolutely make the demands on Libya for a response that has some kind of uh, roots into uh, their ministry as well and to see who was making those responses which were dishonest and which were not giving the truth uh, to a family who were in a state of high anxiety. Um, they, I mean, we know from other cases, and I can say this from my own experience as a, a, as a rather long in the truth lawyer, um, our international court cases, there, there are times when governments for whatever reason are, are, are not uh, standing up and taking responsibility. And I was involved with the Jamal Khashoggi case where I went with Agnes Kalamar, the rapporteur, because Saudi was not responding uh, to, the, to, the, to the serious uh, failure and not just failure, but the crimes that were committed. And we went to Turkey and, and we took steps at the request of Turkey um, about a crime that had happened on its soil. Now, you know, sometimes you just have to have parts of the UN take action. And we can do that by putting pressure on uh, the UN. Um, and we, we were able to do that um, uh, when Saudi Arabia and Turkey had, were, you know, were still inactive and, uh, and people wanted to know um, what had happened to Jamal Khashoggi. Now, the governments here involved are South Africa and Austria, because of course, um, Antoine has citizenships of both countries and the UK where he had made a life and settled with Penny and their children. And so we, these are the nations which have to basically now be stepping up and taking action. And, uh, and I really call upon any, anyone who has connection with government or anyone who's listening in on this call uh, and this uh, webinar to, to be active on, 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 on this campaign. Now, the South African president was here, was invited specially for the G7 um, that was held down in Cornwall just a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, the question, is was it ever raised you know here is you know a, a vitally important issue and it could have been raised and i uh, and uh the suspicion is that it wasn't the libyan um, interim prime minister met with boris johnson just last week do you think it was raised you know is is our foreign ministry you know uh, cluing up the prime minister to actually raise these issues was anton's case discussed in any of these meetings and we have to ask why not and it should be high on the agenda um, particularly, you know, since the UK actually has been in the lead claiming a concern about uh, the erosion of, uh, of uh, uh, protections for journalists and of media freedom. 
globally. So what can you, the audience, do? Well, you've heard from Keelan about what states and the UN can do, but we have, and, we, and of course, you've heard from uh, um, our journalists who told you about what, um, about their organizations um, taking up this cause. But more of us can, can take part in this. Um, tell Anton's story. I mean, it's a shocker. Uh, follow the social media accounts about uh, uh, what the campaign is doing and share news about the case and use the hashtag, the hashtag uh, um, justice for Anton. Um, and you'll see a mention of it in the sidebar. Share a selfie online. I mean, I've done it to show solidarity and support for Penny and the family. And just it just means taking a photograph of yourself, holding up a sign saying justice for Anton. And if possibly wear yellow and uh, and uh, because because for that period where where Penny thought he was still alive um, and, it, and he was just basically in custody, um, um, people then were wait, were carrying a yellow ribbon for him and so it's it just is so heartbreaking it's a yellow ribbon campaign for Anton as a missing person um, and for UK parliamentarians who might be in this audience uh, we need to pressurize the UK government to ensure that Anton's case is given high priority by the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office um, there, there, there can't be missed opportunities like the ones that we've just had, a meeting with the, the, the interim uh, prime minister of Libya, uh, a failure when all those people were gathering together um, for the G7 um, and, the, and the, the, the president of uh, South Africa was here. And, uh, and so there are other issues where we really, well, there are other ways in which we can make this a, a seriously front, front of the agenda campaign, um, but we need you all to take part. So I say that, um, I say it passionately, um, but you know, just, just think of a family that cannot, cannot deal with uh, the death of a really brave and wonderful man um, because they still can't uh, have his remains. And if his remains came here, we could have an investigation ourselves. So please, um, let's get busy and let's do something on this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, roundup of all the kinds of actions that people can take from private individuals to organisations to the member states. Every single one of those actions helps to increase um, the pressure for answers. We have about 12 minutes left to deal with some uh, questions that have been posed. And um, to start with, there was um, an issue raised by Gus Vashafort, Vashafort, sorry if I've pronounced the name wrongly, about uh, the use of the African Court of Human and People's uh, rights and the mechanisms um, of the African regional system and the African Union because um, of them ordering provisional measures against Libya um, in 2011. And Keelan has answered that that question um, uh, in writing, um, uh, saying at the moment we're looking at the UN special procedures, but it's not ruled out that the African uh, uh, court, the African regional system may come to be important in the future. Let me turn to um, the other questions. And there's, there, there, there's a point made by James Wardell, and I don't know whether um, who wants to take this up, whether that's Penny or um, uh, Keelan. But so, what kind of media campaign has occurred in Libya to find Andrew? Anton's body, TV, print, is there a reward for information that leads to the recovery of his body? Um, uh, and he's saying his remains are most likely taken to a local collection site, and he says an approach that aims to reward information, the return of Anton's remains is preferable um, to claiming war crimes were committed, and he says his own experience of being in Libya in 2011 suggests that putting up a reward would be an effective way. I don't know, would someone like to address that? Um, Keelan? Penny, Penny, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so essentially, um, we haven't mounted that sort of campaign. As I um, said very, very honestly, you know, the resource that that entails and the effort um, is not something that was, has ever really been within our reach and among our options as the family. Um, so we've just not been able to do and approach things in that way. Um, I'll just add to that as well, Jeremy. Um, so, James, thank you. Um, we are um, grateful to you for making a very practical suggestion 
And um, the first thing to say is um, that, in fact, we do not think a reward is necessary here because we believe his remains were, in fact, found in 2012 and there is a paper trail. So we've got good reason to believe that, in fact, his remains are readily locatable. Um, and now we hope that there will be political will to put pressure on the current new interim government um, to locate it. And I mentioned earlier some recent examples where that has happened after many years. So that's the first thing. The second thing is just as a matter of principle, I think it's quite wrong um, that a reward money would have to be paid in these circumstances when we believe this is within the knowledge of the state of Libya. I mean, Penny's already mentioned uh, lack of resources for them. And I should say, I mean, one of the uh, things which is very difficult about Anton's case is because Anton was truly an international journalist. So he was a South African and Austrian dual national living in London. I mean, I and many others are immigrants living in the UK who are not British. Anton was the same um, and Penny and her children are the same. And many of the support mechanisms which are available when you lose a loved one abroad rely upon you having British nationality in Britain um, or rely on a body being returned, which didn't happen here. So one of the consequences of that is that some very basic support mechanisms which would otherwise be available if Penny had lost her spouse on the streets of London rather than in Libya, or if Penny's spouse had been British, simply haven't applied. And the idea of um, Penny or the campaign having to pay money in those circumstances is quite abhorrent. Um, so I, I did just wanna say that as a matter of principle, but in practice, in practice, we don't in fact think it's necessary. Um, and we are hopeful that the new interim government in Libya uh, will heed our call and that we'll be aided in doing that with support from other states uh, and civil society and those of you in the virtual room today. I, I also think a number of journalists would have concerns about rewards being paid for locating their remains. I don't think that would make journalists anywhere in the world any safer, although I understand on a practical issue, um, sometimes these are um, things that have to be considered. Um, I don't know if Jeremy Bowen wants to take um, the next one, um, but um, there is a question from Julian Gallimore about, um, which I think relates to the lobbying um, that we were doing. So who is actually the power behind the government in Libya today? Is it Russia like in Syria or are there other states that it would be useful for people to be able to lobby to try to get some movement and action from um, the current Libyan government? Yeah, well, Libya has become um, a, uh, a theme park or playground for foreign powers in, in recent years. Um, the, the Russians have been very active there on one of the sides. On the other side, the Turks have also been, the Turks are particularly active. Uh, at the moment, there is pressure from the interim government, and there recently there was a, uh, an international meeting in in Berlin, in which uh, you know big powers were involved in that, uh, to try to get foreign fighters and foreign mercenaries out of the country, um, there are I think around one estimate is twenty thousand of them. So that is not going to happen overnight, and that probably is a prerequisite for the the sovereignty of the government. So um, it is. I said earlier on that this isn't a bad time to be talking about this because there's an interim government and I absolutely would, would, would stand by that. You know, having said that, power is diffuse in, in Libya, uh, as well as the, the foreign actors who are involved and Egypt's been involved as well, the UAE has been involved, the French have been involved. Uh, and that's just countries which are, um, more open than others about their involvement as well as that there are any numbers any number of uh, militias uh, relating to particular cities and city states that have arisen uh, in the country so you know libya is a very fragmented society so that is a difficulty i would be absolutely honest about that with with doing something like this but that is no reason not to do it and as the interim government does try to, with foreign backing from important countries, does try to um, bring in a system of one government and one gun, 
uh, and not have the power of the militias that has been very evident over the last, well, almost 10 years, then um, I think it's a good time for that. It's, it would be part, you know, I think from the government's point of view, it's part of them regaining their own sovereignty if they're able to look into the ways that these things have played out. And what about the, the fact that elections are due um, towards end the, year, the yeah. end of the year um, and there is the prospect of Gaddafi's son uh, possibly standing for election and what impact that might have on the holding of an investigation or getting the interim government to investigate? It's a complication. You know, this job would be much easier if uh, there was uh, one address which could be easily accessed. Uh, and what they're trying to, to get in Libya is that single address. But yes, there, there are many factors that make this a difficult job. I think we can be absolutely honest about that. Um, but the hope is that at the moment Libya has turned a corner and that it will be getting to a situation where there can be one government with sovereignty over the country eventually. That is the objective. And, you know, journalists, particularly in the Middle East, we often look on the complicated and dark side of what's going on. And so, you know, there are obstacles to that. But this is a good, just doing this process. Certainly as a journalist myself, um, I, you know, I'm reassured by it. I would love to hope that something terrible happened to me, something like this might happen. Uh, th thank you uh, for that and stay safe, please. Um, so also there's a, a, a comment just come from John Battersby, formerly Anton's editor at the Sunday Independent, saying the UK has just appointed a new ambassador to South Africa who is being briefed, uh, maybe a good opportunity opportunity to, for him to raise the issue with the South African government. So thank you. That's a, a, a very useful suggestion. And I'm, I'm sure that, that the legal team and the campaign, um, if not already on it, which I suspect they are, will be um, from now. Given we just have um, a minute or two left, Keelan asked if she could just make another comment. So Keelan, over to you. Just very briefly, um, the comments which were made about the difficulties with Libya are quite right. And in terms of locating Anton's body, um, they are obstacles that we need to overcome and we're very conscious of that. But I mentioned that there were two aims by the family. The other one is for the investigation. And we are not reliant on engagement from the Libyan authorities for that investigation. Of course, it would be better to have engagement from the Libyan authorities. But Helena mentioned earlier the Jamal Khashoggi investigation where you had a situation where neither Saudi Arabia, the state responsible for his grotesque killing, uh, nor Turkey, uh, the location of his killing, were complying with their international human rights obligations. And that's precisely why the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killings, the former office holder, Agnes Calamar, had to step in in the way that she did. I mean, I'm conscious that on this call, we've got some members of Daphne Caruana Galizia's family situation where Malta was not complying with its international obligations and the international community had to put pressure on Malta to hold a, an investigation. So here, if Libya is not doing it, and Libya has had a decade of failing to conduct that investigation, that does not mean we're stuck. It means the international community needs to step in and hold the investigation itself. So if Libya doesn't engage, that is not a game changer. It's not a game ender. Uh, it's still critical that the international community ensures this investigation takes place. Otherwise, impunity reigns. Thank, thank you, Keelan. And um, can I thank you and all the panellists, and in particular, um, Penny, um, and thank everyone who has attended today for their questions, for their comments, and hopefully for the actions you are now going to take. Um, uh, uh, a summary of those actions are um, available at justiceforanton.com. As um, someone said, there's also a social media campaign using the hashtag Justice for Anton and the yellow ribbons that you see some people wearing and that you can see on the the backdrop behind me um, are an important part 
of that um, campaign. And this is a campaign in which there is lots of things that we can all do, but it is also one in which we must because not only for the family, not only for journalists, not only for the public's right to know, but for justice, this is a really important campaign. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you all um, for your support um, and have a good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank you.